previously on the National STEM Championship. We saw our 12 schools battle it out in the quarterfinals. The teams gathered their powers of teamwork and knowledge of all things STEM. Science, technology, engineering and mathematics. They built bridges, messed around with robotic cars, delved into biology, ran through mirror mazes and so much more. They can give themselves a treat now, as tonight, we follow the last six schools competing their way through the six challenges of the National STEM Championship quarterfinals. Hi, I'm Sonia Chu and welcome to the National STEM Championship. Tonight, we'll follow six schools through the quarterfinals and they are... CHIJ St. Nicholas Girls School Anglo-Chinese School Independent Dunman High School River Valley High School Cedar Girls Secondary School and Raffles Girls School They will pit their wits across six stations right here at the Science Centre Singapore But here comes the nerve-wracking bit out of 26 schools, only the top 12 will make it to the semi-finals. And you know what? Will tonight's six schools be a part of that list? Fingers crossed! Before anything else though, it's time for the first challenge. In a short 15 minutes, students had to solve two chemistry equations. After solving each one, they rushed into the mirror maze to find the balls labelled with the right elements. We had a like foundation understanding of organic chemistry and hence had like kind of knew how to do the basic ones. Uh, it was quite difficult as uh, organic chemistry was like a topic that we weren't really expecting and then this challenge was like quite startling to us. Solving the equation did take us some time. It needed a lot of the application of the knowledge we know, not just from chemistry but also some daily life knowledge. We all needed to apply all of it at once. The most difficult part of the challenge is completing the equation because it's something that we are not very familiar with. So the two of them were in charge of the chemical equation and the two of us were in charge of finding the balls in the maze. Definitely we could improve on the actual maze considering that we found no balls. We went in a bit later, so we couldn't, we didn't manage to find any label balls, which set, brought us down a lot. The solution is ethanoic acid. So since the product is vinegar, we just tried to create CH3COOH, which is, yeah, ethanoic acid. We found out that the product of this equation is actually disinfectant. So, we kind of use like our day-to-day -day kind of like knowledge. We know that these infectants usually have like alcohol, which is also known as like ethanol. For the most part, we actually don't really know what propylene is. Okay, you managed to write down carbon-3. How do you know it's a 3 carbon? Yeah, the, carbon first, the, the pro. prefix is pro. 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 Yeah. pro. Okay, uh, that's why this final answer is actually correct. Oh, very good. Uh, so, how many valence electrons does carbon have? Very good, and that means you have Exactly, four bonds. See, see, see this carbon, Ooh. and then there's three hydrogens connected to the carbon as yeah. well as to this carbon. Ooh. So that's four. One, two, three, four. And this one, double bond to O, that's two. One bond to C, that's three. And one bond to O, that's four. We applied all the knowledge that we could and we coordinated very well on the team. And I feel that wh whatever happens next, I think it will be, it won't be too bad. Right, right. Despite the mirror mayhem, all the students managed to find their way out of the maze, which is just amazing. Now, in the next challenge, students have to build a bridge. But the catch is, they've got to do it in just 10 minutes. Wow, that's some high water to cross. Now, let's see how our six schools fared. So in this segment, you guys will be building a bridge using the materials given to you on the table. Things were taken up a notch when students had to use a compulsory material based on the rolling of a die. Let the construction begin. CHIJ, y'all have managed to get all the balls except the basketball, so that's a total of 13 points. Although we couldn't get the height, we tried to use like our item, which was the toothpick, to kind of hold the ball so that it wouldn't roll off. But if we had more time, we would definitely try to like make it taller. So for this thing, you have managed to score only one point, but your height is quite amazing because you have scored a height of 12.5. Uh, initially, you wanted to do like an interlocking design because that offers like a greater structural support. 
but we couldn't complete it by tying the string, so it resulted in it couldn't support much weight and can kept pulling in. I thought it was go going to be a suspension bridge, right? Yeah, it was meant to be a suspension uh, bridge. A pity it didn't work out. Yeah, but we didn't have time to tie it at the last. Dunman High, you guys managed to balance one ping pong ball for a total of one point. And your concept was honestly one of the more novel and interesting concepts throughout the day so far. Initially, our concept was to have something in the middle. And then this newspaper was meant to be a cradle. But I think the biggest problem that we faced is that we did not really know how to tie the wooden sticks together. So in the end, we couldn't really form a sturdy base. And due to time constraints, we could only just create a cradle out of newspaper. Actually, this shows beautifully that a very soft material can become a little bit more rigid when you fold it. We tried to make like a square structure so that it's like strong on all sides. And we also tried to put like the cloths on top because um, if we put it at the bottom, then they'll be like touching the bottom. And since I was kind of like open box kind of structure, so one of the key things we thought about this task is that the arc, even though they said it was a bridge, the arc doesn't really have to be very high. So we wanted to make it a more stable structure by lowering it. And it turned out that this is really a good um, material that we got because it can hold quite a lot of weight. So I think it turned out quite okay in the end. Most of the teams, they look at the materials based on their original properties. They have this paper and a lot of them just use it to place on top. It's not going to hold the weight and it will sink in. Students can think out of the box to improve the properties is to do some origami on it. And if I were to put it on top, not only it increases the height of the bridge, it can easily hold a heavy ball. Well, with such creative solutions, our students are on the way to becoming future engineers. Now, that was the E in STEM, but we still got lots of science, technology and mathematics to cover. We'll find out more after the break. Welcome back to the National STEM Championship quarterfinals. And now, time for the mutation challenge. Our students have to think deeply about biology, but also think quickly because they've only got 15 minutes to discuss a case study and a short five minutes to present. Good luck. The students combined their brain powers to understand how knowledge of existing genetic dysfunctions may improve coronary heart disease. Hi, mister. I think you have a suspected disease called AH. You are at the age of 38 now. You better be careful, you know why? As you can see, the factors affecting FH include the fact that FH is a common genetic disease. What is this genetic defect? So, introducing familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH, refers to individuals with elevated circulating low-density lipoprotein cholesterol. So when does this occur? This happens when there are genetic defects in these three genes. To resolve the situation, we need to use CRISPR gene editing. And this will correct for the faulty translation of melanin line to new sign. It's quite, quite impressive that you guys know about CRISPR and stuff like that. You have the overall picture, so you got that, yeah. What is the problem that's being passed down from generation to generation? Well, the answer is this gene called PCSK9. It is a mutant gene that will cause large amounts of the low-density cholesterol to be in your bloodstream. Not all of us are that great at bio, and because I personally don't take bio, so it was quite a challenge. But I think we managed to pull through it quite well and make use of our teamwork to plan out the presentation quite nicely and manage to give a good answer to the judges. So why exactly are cardiovascular diseases important? Well, cardiovascular diseases cause approximately 25% of all deaths globally. I think you guys did really well. Um, you have the overall idea. And I think I, I do like this clattering stuff. That was something that was out of the actual notes and the question. There's a specific pharmaceutical target. We can use drugs to treat this mutation. So how this works is that the drug will be targeting this clathrin binding in order to reduce the clathrin binding. I think it's uh, highly commendable and uh, thanks a lot. So as for how to treat this disease, we have to use inhibition so that we can make sure that um, this binding does not happen so that the LDR and the PCSK9 will be separated. To solve this, we can like, conduct electrophoresis. This is by random incorporation of D-deoxin nucleotide by DNA polymerase during in vitro um, DNA replication. 
Congrats, you guys. You did extremely well in terms of teamwork, presentation and correct answers. Now, our bright young minds are about to face a barrage of questions posed by kids. That's right, our students are about to become the teachers as they answer questions by primary school students. Oh, how the tables have turned. Find out in just a bit. Okay, welcome teams to this station. It's called Kids Ask, where you'll be answering a question asked by a primary school student. The teams picked their questions from a box, and then they scrambled their kid-friendly presentation together in just 10 minutes. After that, they had five minutes to showcase their colourful presentations. And of course, engaging the young audience is a plus in the judges' eyes. How does a car move? Uh, hey, can I know how a car moves? There are two types of cars, one which uses an internal combustion engine and one which is, runs on electricity. So for the internal combustion engine, fuel goes into the engine of the car. When it enters the engine, it goes into the combustion chamber. Then in the combustion chamber, the spark plug uses electricity to ignite the fuel. It states that electric fields can be converted into magnetic fields. So, for example, putting a magnet through the wire and that creates an electric current. In ACS, it's uh, very strong technically. It gave uh, a very good breakdown of uh, two types of cars. They even included the recent uh, electric cars. And they were able to draw very detailed technical diagrams on, on cars. How does a blue collect pollen? Miss Lim, Miss Lim, how does bees collect pollen? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Shall we go to the Sierra Garden to find out? I wonder if any more new friends will visit me today. Hmm. Oh look, a new friend! Oh my god, you smell so sweet and you are so brightly coloured. Wow, I want some nectar. Nom 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 nom. Oh my god! What is this? It's pollen! I want you to spread it to the rest of my flowery friends. How is it sticking to me? Why is it sticking on me? Oh, that's actually quite simple. You see, the pollen has a very rough surface and it's also really sticky. Because of this, it catches onto your very hairy legs. No offence, your legs are beautiful. And it's also really light, so it's very easy for you to carry it off to the rest of your flowery friends. Okay, I shall go get more nectar. Buzz, buzz. Their skit is very detailed in terms of explaining the concepts like, uh, like how the pollen is being passed to the bee and how the bee is being attracted. How this works is basically the bee, which is very hairy, which has many pouches, it is attracted by the nectar and the brightly coloured petals of the beautiful flowers and they will go in, the hairs on their body will rub off some of the pollen grains and the pouches can be used to store the pollen grains as well. River Valley, I was uh, impressed by their diagram and some nice technical details about uh, pouches on the lakes. Why do I float on water? So my swimming coach told me that I should just lie flat on the water to stay afloat so that I can survive out in the sea. But why do I float? I am so heavy. Um, so there are two reasons. Density and buoyancy. For density, it's mass over volume. Um, so a human being would be less dense than water because of the air in your lungs. Buoyancy actually means that the downward force of the body on the surface of the water is less than or equal to than the upward force by the water. I think they put it in a very good context with the use of the swimming pool and I also like the diagrams they drew and they were able to illustrate the two concepts of buoyancy and density very well. So, picture this. You're, you go to the swimming pool and you know what's the first thing to do? Ah, psh, cannonball! But why do I seem to do this thing? Why do I float? So, this will be the question that we'll be answering today. We made use of analogies, we made use of rhetorical questions to make the presentation more engaging and lively. And then we also simplified the words down to like rather layman terms and broke down everything so that it could be digested by them. We have some, this really complex word, Archimedes Principle. What is that? It's basically a principle which says how the object behaves in water. Diamond High, I was impressed that they actually mentioned Archimedes Principle and they also broke down the concept gradually as well. How is fire made? So just when your mom cooks your favourite dish, 
She doesn't do it with just two ingredients. Sometimes you need a lot of things to come together. And that's the case with fuel and oxygen. Trying to explain it in very simple terms so that the primary school students can understand the concepts easier. And also they are very quick in their thinking in terms of uh, replying the questions that's raised during the Q&A session. And they make it very simple and easy to understand. So you may be wondering, this friction thing, does that mean if you rub your hands enough, you'll eventually catch on fire? Well, I mean, yes. There was a post going around a while back about how if you slap a chicken enough times, it will cook. So yeah, it's somewhere, it's something like that. So fire is all around us. It seems like our judges were really impressed by our six schools. You should be so proud of yourselves. Now it's time to go off our break, but when we come back, our students take it to the limits by building boats, cracking some codes, and trying not to melt wax. We'll see you in a bit. Welcome back to the National STEM Championship. Our six schools are down to the second last challenge and they're given a couple of remote controlled cars to play with? Nope, it's a trap. Our brainy students have to crack some computer codes to make the car go. Sheesh, I'll see how it goes. Within just 10 minutes, students will have to figure out the code for the robotic car by examining both the remote control and the movements of the car. Watch out for the different combinations. And after that, they will give a short presentation to the judges. Sounds tough? Don't worry, the students are in control. The first thing that we did is to press buttons, of course, right? So we press the A button first. So we realised that it turned left. And in order for it to turn to the left, the right wheel actually has to turn. The arrow pointing to the left would show, and then there's Moto1 and Moto2. So Moto2 is the right Moto, Moto1 is the left Moto. So in order to turn to the left, you have to move like this. As such, the right Moto moves. As for the other way around, you can see the arrow changes, which means it will go to my right and it's your left. And the, my favourite one actually, is when you press A and B together, both motors turn and then it goes forward. We actually didn't know whether the Moto 1 command, Moto 2 command would actually run the motors indefinitely. But if, it, if this was the case, then it would have added a turn off after some time. Like maybe one second. When you don't press anything, the microbit car actually shows X here. That's why for the forever loop, I put that uh, X LED is shown. For those who can score quite well, they attempt to have very good teamwork. They can articulate their ideas very well and it flows from team player to team player. And when they are starting to work on their problem, right, they can delegate the work quite well as well. Like some people will okay, focus on the code, some people okay, let's try and play with this uh, toy. So it's pretty good delegation of their duties. I think across the board, uh, each school has uh, its strengths and uh, weaknesses. Uh, different teams have shown uh, different levels of uh, ingenuity. Some um, are more systematic in their approach, but others uh, tend to surprise you. You know, some of the things you were able to catch actually did, did surprise me quite a bit. So uh, give yourselves uh, a round of applause. Uh, good, great job, great job everyone. Awesome job, you guys, but you know what? I think I'm going to stick to some actual driving for now. Coming up next, though, our students are about to land themselves in hot water for the insulation challenge. They were given just 10 minutes to shop for some materials to build a boat that would keep their beeswax safe from the hot water. Now, the winning beeswax would be the one that melts the least. All the best. All right, uh, welcome to the very last station. Okay, it's called the insulation station. Aluminium boy, ah? Some aluminium foil. We used felt cloth and aluminium foil to wrap around the beeswax. One felt. One felt. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Yeah. One felt. One felt. Perfect, perfect. We used a piece of aluminium foil and a piece of felt cloth to make a floating raft design to insulate our beeswax sample and to optimize the heat loss by radiation. Yeah, I think so. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Oh, 
Okay, time's up. Okay, so both of you will lower your prototype into the water and we'll wait seven minutes. Okay, so you're you have 3.3 feet. And in the end, we lost uh, 0 0.32 grams of beeswax. I think instead of wrapping the beeswax with felt cloth and aluminium foil, we could have instead approached the challenge in a different way by maybe constructing more of like a boat or a floating device so that less heat will be trapped inside. Okay. 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 Okay, Naman High or Beeswax Method? I think that our Beeswax challenge, it went wrong in the sense that our wrapping wasn't exactly very tightly wrapped. So then this caused there to be a bunch of small like little holes and openings within our Beeswax coating, made it such that the boiling water could enter through these little openings and also caused the whole structure of the beeswax to like move and then at one point it actually toppled over. And I think that that's what caused the beeswax to melt at the end. Real value 3.54. We managed to keep the bee wax like unmelted and it survived quite well throughout the seven minutes in the hot water. Okay, thank you very much. Good for you students, you kept your cool in the midst of hot water. Now to our six schools here today, you can finally relax because you are done with the quarterfinals. Well done too. As for tonight's six schools, here are their rankings. Out of the 26 schools, only 12 will make it through to the semi-finals. Who will it be? Well, you can stop holding your breath for now because we are about to find out. Congratulations to Anglo-Chinese School Independent, Bukit Panjang Government High School, CHIJ St. Nicholas Girls School, Hua Chong Institution, NUS High School of Math and Science, Raffles Girls School, Raffles Institution, River Valley High School, School of Science and Technology Singapore, St. Joseph's Institution, Swiss Cottage Secondary School, and Sinmin Secondary School. What new challenges will await them? you got to find out in the next episode of the National STEM Championship. Meantime, I'm Sonia Chu and I'll see you next time. In the world, how did they die? Why does the apple tell you really What is a source of light?